Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. And if Warner Brothers hasn't yet sent out its copyright sentinels to destroy this video, then thanks for joining me today. Love you. But I digress. I stand before you today in my underwear, asking for your ear so that I may attempt to through it persuade you that the message of the Matrix Resurrections is widely misunderstood. Now, as a recent leader of the free world once said, let me be clear. This video is only going to deal with the themes of the film. It's a philosophy video, not a review. If you absolutely must know my opinion of the film overall, well, I think the first half is really interesting and entertaining, and the second half takes a bit of a nosedive. But again, I'm only here today to talk themes. Now, I'm a sucker for The Matrix, almost entirely because of the original Matrix film. Despite being inspired by countless sci-fi predecessors, all art is derivative after all, it is truly novel in its style, choreography, thinking, and more. And while its first two sequels don't quite match its combination of intellectual prowess and subtlety, they do enough to keep the philosophical questions inherent to the series relevant and evolving. And to an acceptable extent, Resurrections does the same. Now, I'm not here today to tell you that you're stupid for misinterpreting the true message of the film, if you even did. I think there's fault to go around, the viewers for being reactionary rather than contemplative, and the filmmaker for perhaps not executing their message as clearly as they might have intended to. And then of course, many of you have no qualms with the philosophy or themes of the film, and your problems lie more with the overall story and characters. But I digress. In order for me to be able to eventually illustrate how Resurrections has evolved and deepened the Matrix's philosophy relative to the original films, allow me to first review the ideas those films examine. The original Matrix explores what it means to exist, and what reality is, and how it can be differentiated from a simulation. I thought it wasn't real. Your mind makes it real. The first three Matrix films actually all engage in a sincere intellectual struggle to determine how one can deny the reality of something the mind believes exists. How can a man be dead if someone else knows for 100% sure that the man is alive? Of course, the original Matrix's main point of conflict is between free will and determinism, and the conversation concerning the clash between these two concepts is what, to me, makes the original film so groundbreakingly intelligent and philosophically inventive. And don't worry about the vase. What vase? The Matrix takes no firm stance on the issue, but it does painstaking work to explore the supposed spontaneity and independence of human action. Causality. Action, reaction, cause, and effect. Everything begins with choice. No. Does free will really exist, or is it but a notion that arises due to the limits of human intellect, specifically our inability to place events in sequence according to causal factors? And as an extension necessitated by the debate between free will and determinism, the first three Matrix films question the legitimacy of choice. Why, Mr. Anderson, why, why do you persist? Because I choose to. And The Matrix ultimately makes no strident conclusions about choice, and instead opts to say, the best one can do is believe they have a choice and hope no one can ever prove otherwise. In other words, no matter the powers that be, there's always a greater truth, and because of that, there's always reason for hope, even within a seemingly controlled existence. Did you always know? Oh no, no I didn't, but I believed. Hope is thus connected to free will and free will to optimism where determinism is paralleled with cynicism. A long time ago, when we first came here, it was so different. He was so different. He was like you. And this last idea is revisited in Resurrections. Everything was simpler back then. People wanted to be free. It's different now. However, in general, the free will versus determinism concept, so integral, no pun intended, to the original trilogy, is seemingly playfully mocked by Resurrections, as if to say, we're done with you and leaving you behind. You tell me, Mr. Anderson, is it free will or destiny? I was really looking forward to continuing the thoughtful conversation that The Matrix began in 1999, now once more, following Resurrections. And what is this? 
it appears the film has made it clear pretty early on that most of those ideas native to the old films are tired now. I thus suppose this moment must be a farewell to the themes of yesterday and a motion to move on. Or is it? But more on that later. So anyway, where does the new film take us? Well, perhaps one of the reasons Resurrections has left so many people confused is that it tries to take us in a lot of directions, however briefly. The film explores many different ideas in its first hour, an hour which is actually really entertaining. Its setting is vibrant and engrossing, and the whole plot set up with a post-machine war memory-wiped Neo recreating the Matrix as a series of computer games in order to search for the truth about his past on a subconscious level is a fitting and creative way to incorporate modern escapism into the film and lead into some deep questions about memory and dreams. And additionally, the new versions of old characters exed into the new Matrix as a really intriguing plot line as well. Moving on though, by far the most important idea Resurrections introduces during its first half is the concept of mental illness as being in actuality mental clarity. I felt either I'm having a mental breakdown again, or I'm living inside a computer-generated reality that has imprisoned me. The first half of the film does a fairly good job exploring this idea through the analyst, who wields the weight of diagnosis as a weapon to defame and discredit those who are actually onto the truth and awakening to reality. Thomas, none of this is real. You are in the midst of a serious psychotic break. What happens when people wake up and see things how they are? Understand the implications of existence. Do they go crazy or do they go uncrazy? Well, before we can really go somewhere interesting with these questions, the second half of the film kicks in and a more singular theme takes over which seems to concern the willful acquiescence of the masses to malicious powers. I think this is a bad take though, or at least it's a bit of a misguided analysis of the movie. Here's where most people make a mistake in interpreting Resurrections. As I said, in the second hour of the film, its central message comes to light and takes control of the narrative. And it's easy to infer that this message is basically the masses are blind to the truth as a result of brainwashing by the arbiters of society. And yeah, this idea is sort of simplistic, and were it the point the film is trying to make, then I would aver that Lana Wachowski has reduced her own narrative from the brilliant exploration of the prime forces behind human action and all the events in the universe it was into a reflection of how the fans and people at large have perverted it for their own political means. And in demeaning the film's philosophy in this way, its thesis would reasonably be deemed trite and awfully juvenile. How insipid would the film be if its guiding principle was a plea to the masses in the fashion of wake up to the truth, ye blind sheep? The sheeple aren't going anywhere. They like my world. From this primary instance of mistaken analysis, I've seen a lot of people then go on to claim that the film is an open criticism of human complacency and subjectivism. You don't give a shit about facts. It's all about fiction. And you people believe the craziest shit. And were this the film's main objective, I myself would criticize it as reductive fare by asking, are people today more vulnerable to being hoodwinked by insidious fictions perpetrated on them by nefarious leaders than they were in times of yore? Are humans disdainful of facts and quick to believe the craziest things? Or are the facts at hand simply in dispute? Are facts easily discernible from fictions or are they frequently hard to pinpoint? If we don't know what's real, can't resist. Uh-oh, resist? Sounds like the politics of the team I hate, says the viewer. I mean, does this film only care to be a call to action, a rallying cry for the masses to resist some phantom tyrant and emerge from a state of world-weary peace-loving unconsciousness that advances a once-free society unto decay? Despite my verbosity here, this would be the makings of some basic shit. You care more about growing fruit than freeing minds. We are. And yet it's wrong. The film actually never explicitly takes any concrete position on the American political spectrum. Or am I wrong? In my view, those claiming the film is some wokest manifesto are mistaken and paranoid, though I can understand the paranoia to some degree. I saw a lot of people online making a fuss about how one of the screenwriters of Resurrection said he wants to reclaim the red pill from the political right. Well, his actual quote is fairly anodyne and just speaks to depoliticizing the red pill from the trope it's become, not to turning it into a political weapon of the left. 
The pills don't matter that much to the overall trajectory of the Matrix series. They're a fun and novel plot device that work in with its larger themes. It's the fans who, in the years following the movie, have turned them into the cultural symbols we know and swallow today. Truth be told, Resurrections is so vague and benign in its allusions to today's political milieu that it actually ends up saying nothing at all indicative of political bias. And I'd imagine it'd be pretty hard to find a less ideologically provocative science fiction film in today's day and age. And so this begs the question, if the film's goal is to chastise the masses for being complacent, apathetic sheeple, then why be so tactful in laying out its agenda, Wachowski? Why not say directly, screw the Trumpists? Well, because that isn't what it intends to do. It doesn't seek to only say, we stupid masses are happy to be lied to and controlled, thus making it easy for malicious elites to exploit us by engaging our emotions and holding us in fear. Desire and fear, baby. Just give the people what they want, right? The film does illustrate a divide between two different entities, but, and this is an operative area of misapprehension, the divide it implies is not hierarchical or economic in nature. It's not a divide between president and people. Rather, it is a divide between all forces, centrally illustrated in the film through the divide between human and machine. They believed that it had to be us or them. It's hard to notice because the film stumbles a bit to convey it coherently, but the secret to understanding the Matrix Resurrections lies in binaries. I've been thinking about us, Tom. What about binaries that form the nature of things? If you think that the film only intends to criticize human willful ignorance and acquiescence to depraved leaders, then to be consistent, you must also believe that the film intends to criticize human emotion, because that's the reason the analyst gives to explain why humans are so easily manipulated. What validates and makes your fictions real? Feelings. So do you? Do you think that Lana Wachowski hates feelings and advocates humanity assume the emotionlessness of robots? Although only a human mind could invent something as insipid as love. Of course not. The analyst is the bad guy, remember? But Resurrections does seek to criticize human indulgence in their emotions. That's what creates the problems, imbalance. And when emotions come together with cold reason, or humans come together with robots, balance is restored via the product of binary forces. This city was built by us and them. Io, the newly built human capital which has risen in the shadow of Zion's fall, is a city that bears fruit, but only because it has attained equilibrium among forces. Man and machine have broken the binary. Back in the first Matrix film, Agent Smith misconstrues how equilibrium is achieved. Every mammal on this planet instinctively develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment, but you humans do not. He infers equilibrium to be exclusively accomplished by individual groups in relation to their environments. But on the contrary, it is something that is reached and maintained among all forces in existence, through an infinite number of binaries which all together produce a singular entity, the universe of which we are all parts. In other words, all forces in the universe require equal counteracting forces to exist and thrive. And this idea is maximally encapsulated by the relationship between Neo and Trinity. Like acids and bases, you're dangerous when mixed together. Every sim where you two bonded, let's just say bad things happened. The analyst realizes that when he brings Neo and Trinity close together, but maintains the binary, they produce great energy. In my matrix, the worse we treat you, the more we manipulate you, the more energy you produce. This is Newton's second law of motion. A body acted upon by force moves in such a manner that the time rate of change of momentum equals the force. However, when the binary breaks and Neo and Trinity are bonded, a singular entity is produced capable of extraordinary power, the power of all things. The binary is an illusion a lie that prevents us from seeing that we are all part of a whole. And when we absolve ourselves of this illusion, we come to have the power of everything, because we have the power of, yeah, the one. 
heard of that term before? Rather than the power of two separate entities. Of course, one cannot deny the implications for gender inclusive to this idea, given the experience of the film's creator. But I'm not going to delve into that because the idea doesn't exclusively apply to gender. It applies to all things. And this is how Resurrections evolves the philosophy of the Matrix franchise. It takes all of the binaries conveyed in previous films, Man vs. Machine, Red Pill vs. Blue Pill, The Oracle vs. The Architect, and says they aren't binaries at all. They exist together as part of a whole. And thus now we also understand the meaning of the scene where the character Jude, Neo's co-worker, pokes fun at the free will versus destiny binary that's so prominent in all three original Matrix films. The paradox between free will and destiny. Are we all just algorithms doing what we're supposed to do or can we escape our programming? He's not poking fun actually. He's emphasizing the concept because as a sentient program, he wants Neo to keep believing in the binary. And if you watch my recent video in which I explain free will and fate in the Matrix through the role of the Oracle, then you'll know that the original Matrix trilogy demonstrates how free will and determinism can work together. Or, sorry, rather, how both are one. The Matrix Resurrections now takes the next step and says, it's time to overcome the binaries. Not by changing them, but by changing our perception of them. There is no spoon. Then you'll see that it is not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself. And this brings us full circle. As always with The Matrix, everything connects. And so too does it end with a thought that rounds out its thesis. Neo and Trinity fly into The Matrix and visit the Analyst, who opines to them that their victory will be short-lived as humans want to be controlled. They don't want this sentimentality. They don't want freedom or empowerment. They want to be controlled. And Neo follows up by asserting that, in fact, they aren't there to negotiate, but instead they plan to remake the world, remind people what a free mind can do, and are there to thank him. You gave us something we never thought we could have. And what is that? Another chance. Here, our main characters recognize the workings of a binary. Forces work together to produce a greater product, and without the analyst acting to exert control over humanity, Neo and Trinity, an opposite force, would never have been compelled to rise and cultivate freedom. Said more plainly, here, quite insightfully, Lana Wachowski recognizes the importance of negative forces in inspiring positive change, and of course the opposite is presumably true as well. All forces are necessary, all are part of the same whole, and thus share a common goal. As we all exist within the same realm of physical laws, we're not separate things, but part of one larger thing, even if it seems like a body is enough to separate one from this whole. Anyways, that's the video. If you enjoyed it, please do give it a big thumbs up. I'm definitely looking forward to your comments, so please add them down below. Remember to subscribe to this channel and hit that damn notification bell so you don't miss a damn thing. For now, my name is American Pen, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.